The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The views, information, or opinions expressed by hosts or guests are their own. Neither the show nor any of its content should be construed as investment advice or as a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security. Security-specific information shared on this podcast should not be relied upon as a basis for your own investment decisions. Be sure to do your own research. The podcast hosts and participants may have a position in the securities mentioned personally through sub-accounts and or through separate funds and may change their holdings at any time. Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. Welcome, everybody, to this new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. Great to have you with us for another conversation. Great to have my co-hosts here, Phil Ordway and Elliot Turner. We're going to be talking about the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, some takeaways, some thoughts from the three of us. Uh, Phil was actually there in person, so I'm going to turn it to you, Phil, to get us started. Sure. Thanks, John. So uh, I thought I'd just offer a quick uh recap and some, some high-level observations from the meeting, since uh, I know a lot of us probably couldn't attend in person, including John and Elliot. And uh, that was the first thing that actually jumped out at me was, uh, despite some predictions to the contrary, it was noticeably much, much quieter than in prior years. Um, you know, I'm, I've am i been now, I think, 14 times, something like that. Um, and you know, the, I, I didn't get up this time at four in the morning for the running of the bulls like I have a few times in the past. I strolled in at 8.15 and very fa- very easily found a seat. Uh, granted, in the upper level, I mean, the, the lower bowl filled up right away. But even when the movie started, I mean, there were probably many, many thousands of empty seats in the arena, whereas in years past, it was usually full uh, to the brim, even behind the stage where you could only see on the video screen. So... You know, there, there were some people in the overflow rooms over in the exhibit hall, but uh, in general, it, and I saw some commentary from the hotels that things were a little quieter and, you know, certainly some of the restaurants and the traffic and stuff definitely seemed quieter than, you know, I still remember the 50th anniversary uh, meeting, which was what, six years ago now. And uh, that was just a complete circus. And this was way, way, way quieter and more manageable than that. So, but that said, it was great to be back in person. It was wonderful to see uh, both a lot of friends that I haven't seen in, in a couple of years and to see the virtual leadership there uh, in person, all in, in remarkably good health. It was great to see that um, you know, time keeps ticking, but you know, the, it doesn't seem to move quite as quickly for, for some of the Berkshire folks, you know, both Buffett and Munger were in person and in remarkably good health and as sharp as ever. And, uh, that, that was just fantastic. And yeah, we'll, I'll, I'll run through, uh, some of the things that were touched upon I mean, in terms of the results themselves. I think the thing that jumped out was that for the first time in a while, some real cash is getting put to use. Uh, there was a, $51 billion of equity purchases in the quarter uh, against the 10 billion of sales. We don't have full details on that, but a net 40 billion was put to work. A uh, big chunk of that was in Chevron, which now stands as the fourth biggest equity holding, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, obviously, Occidental was another big purchase during the quarter that was previously disclosed to over 10%. And then the new one that was disclosed that was pretty interesting was uh, kind of a, a workout position in Activision. So there was a pre-existing holding dating to last October or November of about a billion dollars made by one of the other investment managers at Berkshire, uh, right around the current price, $76, $77 a share. And then in January, um, after the price had dipped even further in December, uh, Microsoft came out, of course, and announced an acquisition of Activision for $95 a share. And so at that point, over some months there in the first quarter, uh, Berkshire bought a position that now equals about nine and a half percent of Activision. And Buffett's stated thought there was basically that the deal is going to close. Um, he, he's not he's not doing traditional merger. Are we buy the target and short the acquirer? But he's just long 
at least he didn't disclose that, but uh, wouldn't make much sense in this situation either way. I mean, there's there's no doubt about the ability and desire to close the purchase, but of course there's the antitrust question. And that's what's interesting, right? Is that the, uh, you know, the market would be implying some pretty dire odds for the deal closing. Even this morning with uh, his bullish commentary, the stock's up a, a touch, but it's only up, you know, 2% and still a 20 points spread between the current price and the, the takeout bid. If the deal closes next year, I think most people would pretty gladly take a 20% return at this point. So the, the market implied odds are pretty pretty dire. Buffett obviously just sees it differently, which, um, you know, as he's wants to do, it's great. So uh, cash still stands well over the hundred billion, but that's down uh, almost 40 billion from last year. So there was a big reduction in cash on the books and the Allegheny purchase of about 11.6 billion is, is yet to come. That was of course the other big deal that was announced recently. Uh, the equity book now on the balance sheet stands at almost 400 billion, uh, 390.5 billion dollars carried on the balance sheet. The fixed income book by comparison is much, much smaller, about 22 billion. Assets are creeping up toward a trillion which is hard to believe. Book value is about 500 billion. Um, and that's uh, interesting. It, it, it's largely a function of the fact that, you know, the, the investment that the company's making continues to be pretty massive. Uh, you know, the, the balance sheet is, is growing on the asset side, but on the liability side, they're actually sucking out a pretty good bit of capital. So there was a $3.2 billion net repurchase of Berkshire's own stock in the first quarter. And the share count is now down 4% over the last 12 months. And, uh, a little more than 9% over the last uh, eight quarters, the last two years. So that's a pretty material reduction in the share count, all done at what I think they obviously regarded as attractive prices. And uh, you know, that's pretty interesting. And in this rough quarter uh, for the world and, and most of the markets uh, writ large, I mean, Berkshire's operating system series held in extremely well. Operating earnings were flat year over year, basically up a touch actually. And uh, that was despite uh, a pretty significant drop in insurance underwriting, pretty much all the other reported segments or business lines that you would care about actually showed flat or positive operating earnings performance over the year over year basis. So that, that's pretty appealing that insurance float actually went up about 6% year over year to 148 billion. Uh, and so yeah, the, the Berkshire market cap now stands at almost 700 billion. And uh, on a trailing 12 months basis through the annual meeting, so from annual meeting to annual meeting, uh, the trailing 12 month total returns about 14.7%, uh, which is pretty darn good. And it is particularly interesting compared to a negative 1.3% for the S&P 500. So for the first time in, in quite a while, just a massive outperformance and exactly the kind of market that I think uh, they would want to try to do that in, not that they can control the share price, of course, but. Um, so yeah, that, that was kind of a top level review of the results. I mean, some of the stuff that, that stood out to me was a uh, very strident criticism of Robinhood again, uh, that share price is down about 90% from last August. Uh, the the uh, commentary around the markets being as speculative and prone to gambling, the term gambling parlor was thrown around a whole bunch. Um, you know, Munger referred to it several times as not pretty to watch, you know, disgusting at various points, uh, extremely critical of Robin Hood and the role they've played there. And, and he was frankly glad to see that it was unraveling. Now, likewise on Bitcoin, uh, Buffett said he wouldn't buy all of it if it were offered to him for $25 because he just doesn't know what to do with it. And it doesn't have any intrinsic value in his mind because it literally doesn't produce anything. So even at kind of the logical extreme, uh, he just has no interest in participating in that. Another recurring theme that came back was that size continues to be an anchor as they have warned for at least 20 years, probably more like 30 years that at some point Berkshire would become so big as to shrink the competitive field on which it can participate. And we've certainly reached that point. So it's just gotten to where no deal of any size that could possibly be meaningful to Berkshire can be ignored. But there just aren't that many of them. And that was hammered home many, many times as, uh, as we saw. And there's just so few opportunities to put that kind of money to work that can actually move the needle. That's why Activision is probably the one and only merger workout kind of situation they could even pretend to participate in at $75 billion, I think, is the purchase price there. So it's a big enough even for them. Uh, let's see. What else? The market cap now is about one point. 
three, six times book value, but they were buying back stock pretty handily around or above that level throughout. I mean, again, we, we raised the floor there from, I think it was 1.2 originally to 1.3 and then got rid of it altogether. So I think it's safe to say that that is no longer any sort of hard cap or hard test. Um, so a couple of other interesting things and recommendations that they made. Um, Buffett refer, referred repeatedly to this book, Trillion Dollar Triage by a uh, Wall Street Journal, Journal reporter named Nick Timmerhouse. I have not read it. Uh, but it's about the the uh, crisis response of the, the Fed and the Treasury yeah, when COVID broke out two years ago. Uh, it looks very interesting. A couple of friends of mine are reading it right now. I have to report back, uh, but that definitely looks like a, an interesting one. And you know that was tied closely to the con to the discussion of inflation, which was also pervasive throughout the meeting. And and the basic thought there was that yeah, of course we're having lots of inflation. That's what happens when you throw trillions of dollars at a problem. You know, administering a multi-trillion dollar response like that is almost always going to be or is always going to be problematic. Uh, you know, there's always going to be pockets of fraud and misspent dollars in that in that pool of that size of done under duress and very little ability to plan it out. So he was quite complimentary of Jay Powell and the response and uh, said, you know, look, if we're getting inflation because of, as a direct result of that, we basically just need to live with it um, more or less. And so there was not much, there were certainly no hard predictions about where inflation will go from here in, in exact uh, percentage terms or anything like, anything like that. I did find interesting that for the first time that I've found anyway, I, a CEO is willing to go on record and say that he thought some of the cost pressures in supply chain bottlenecks would ease soon. And that was actually the Brooks CEO, the running shoe athletic apparel company, uh, gave an interview beforehand where he said they have been raising prices to consumers, but they have somewhat limited limited pricing power in that regard. But he's hopeful that some of the cost pressures they're seeing now could ease soon, which is interesting because they obviously have a multinational supply chain. I believe they moved most of their production to Vietnam some years ago. And They've seen some massive disruptions on a rolling basis over the last two years, of course, but maybe that's a good sign. I, I certainly hope he's right. Um, oh, and, and flipping back to the book thing, um, in a shout out to you know former guest on the podcast, Charlie Munger's pick this year, his book recommendation, so to speak, his pick in the bookworm in the exhibit hall was the Caesar Palace Coup, uh, which is pretty cool. So we obviously had one of the co-authors there, Max Rooms, on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, um, and I do highly recommend that book, particularly uh, to folks that want to get a peek kind of behind the scenes as to what private equity and distressed investing can really be like. It's a fascinating portrait, so pretty cool that he read that book and recommended it. Um, speaking of Charlie, uh, he did get a question, of course, on China, and he said that basically he's willing to take on some of the risks there, and he acknowledged that people's perception of the risks surrounding China are far higher than they were a couple of years ago. Uh, but he basically said that he's willing to accept those risks because he thinks he's getting better companies at lower prices. Uh, I don't think there was a direct question about any of the individual companies in China. If there was, I missed it, but uh, he kind of shrugged um, and acknowledged the situation, but it didn't seem to be a, a total 180 or even a significant deviation from his prior thoughts, that's for sure. And then, of course, the two shareholder proposals that um, came up during the formal meeting portion of the event. There was the one from CalPERS that was, uh, uh, they were asking to split the role of chairman and CEO, basically remove Buffett as chairman and install someone else. And uh, that failed pretty handily, as you might expect. And Charlie Munger called it one of the, I think his word was asinine, one of the most asinine things he's ever seen. <laughs> and uh, the other one was a more uh, a, a shareholder proposal that would have required a more comprehensive company-wide report on carbon footprints and uh, that sort of thing. And that also failed. I don't think either one was a big surprise, but I think there was some thought among certain people that there might be a little more grassroots support for one or both of those proposals, but neither one proved to be the case. So with that, I'll stop there and uh, kick it over to you guys for, for your thoughts. Yeah, so it sounds like, um, you know, it was great to see a lot of people there. I wish I could have gone. I was supposed to go to the uh, 2020 um, meeting, but, you know, that's 
the first one that hadn't happened. And this one uh, wasn't possible for me to travel. But anyway, I got to listen to as much as I could. And I followed some uh, great tweet storms, uh, some threads on what was uh, being said and the topics of conversation. Um, I did find the merger art piece fascinating. That's been a part of uh, Buffett's toolkit for quite some time. I don't think it's been deployed uh, recently. Um, and you know, maybe he's got some, uh, conviction that it gets through. Uh, I mean, I'd imagine he's got quite a bit, but it's interesting to see such a sizable position, like to be able to go in that big and merger arb. And I'd imagine there's some degree to which he's like, Hey, you know, worst case, it's not a bad business, but more likely than not, it gets close. Um, I wonder, you know, in this environment, if there will be some more, such uh, those kinds of opportunities that open up. Um, I don't expect to see Buffett take a position in the Twitter merger arb. It's got way more uh, esoteric risk than does Microsoft closing on Activision. Um, I found the like uh, magnitude and velocity with which Buffett allocated in the first, well, I should say Berkshire, not Buffett per se, uh, in the first quarter to be very interesting. You know, there was a lot of consternation about why uh, Berkshire was so slow to allocate during the COVID crash. And I'd just posit some thoughts that, you know, in peak COVID fear, it was a lot harder to, to, to have a grasp for what the world would look like in a couple months or even a couple years. And, you know, I go back to thinking that um, after the um, financial crisis, you know, the bottom was in 2009. And there were great returns from 2009. But 2011 was the valuation low for the market and was like a much clearer uh, risk reward than was peak uncertainty in the financial crisis. And I'm not exactly saying now is better valuations than were than existed during COVID. I'm not, I'm not saying that. Um, but I do think in terms of where the world's going and how you could frame what is certain and what's not, or what's knowable and what's not knowable from here, I think it's definitely a little easier. And you are actually seeing some pretty damn good businesses trading at or below their uh, pre-COVID levels. So maybe that motivated something, or maybe it's that Buffett has a great lens on inflation, has some fears about inflation. And a lot of this allocation is going to stuff like um, energy companies and merger are, but not necessarily direct bets on the economy and clarity thereof. So it'll be really interesting to see the 13F and get a broader perspective on, you know, which of these potential theories is is right or not. Um, and then, you know, I thought there was one really interesting quote about inflation um, that, you know, I, I think Buffett called Powell a hero and that it was, it, inflation exists today for all the right reasons. And I think, you know, it's worth emphasizing because a lot of people try to moralize around inflation and what, and don't necessarily reason, uh, or or they assume certain counterfactuals that weren't possible at all. And we're in this for some of the right reasons, but um, you know, like you said, Phil, interesting to hear the Brooks CEO say, "Hey, maybe you know the supply chain stuff is is getting behind us." And we've heard indications of that from Amazon too in their earnings last week. They said that they have you know, some of the best uh, fill times since before the pandemic by a lot. Um, so maybe, just maybe it's starting to ease and that might have motivated the allocations here. But Yeah, I don't know. I One other thing I should have mentioned to your point uh, about a forward-looking view of the world. I mean, you, you can't now ignore certainly the, uh, the massive added exposure to the energy sector, right? I mean, he did talk a lot about how no one would have thought or expected or predicted that we'd see front month oil futures contracts trading at negative $37 a barrel. And that was with a little bit of, you know, a meaningful multi-billion dollar exposure to the oxy preferred at that point, I think. And uh, certainly now he's got a lot more exposure to Occidental and a huge exposure to Chevron. And, uh, you know, it, rightly or wrongly. I mean, that's a pretty big explicit bet on what the next several years is going to look like uh, in the industry without any near-term prognostication of the price of oil or anything like that. I mean, that is a very significant bet and uh, not one that I'm sure he's made lightly. So I think that's certainly worth pointing out. Yeah. And I think it's also pretty significant that, um, you know, he's 
embracing commodity companies. I mean, in the past, I feel like, especially with Munger's influence, um, they're they've been known for buying great businesses that that grow over time. And now, you know, Munger had some very complimentary things to say about ExxonMobil, I believe. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, it sounds like they recognize or believe that, you know, the world is lacking in certain commodities and that that's a good place to, to put your money. Um, I think Charlie's comments on Bitcoin were not surprising. That's been his view for, for a long time. Um, so nothing new there. Um, Buffett kept going back to that owning a farm analogy to explain a lot of their approach and philosophy. It's kind of simplistic, but I think it's just an anchor for them in terms of how did they think about investing versus where the market's gone um, more toward the gambling uh, side of things or the casino aspect. But one thing that they did mention that market irrationality actually benefits Berkshire. And I think that's absolutely true. I mean, if you are a long-term rational investor, you want others to be irrational. I think a lot of um, even professional investors forget that. And they kind of feel like, well, we have to adapt to the new market environment and we got to you know, outsmart or we got to get on board with some of this irrationality to make money. But actually, if you are just a, a long-term investor, you you don't want to get on board with that. You want to you wanna go contrary, but you got to make sure that, that you truly do have a long-term uh, time horizon and hopefully permanent capital. If you don't, you, you could uh, get into trouble. Um, and, you know, Berkshire deployed a lot of money into equities, uh, but one comment by Munger I found striking. I think he basically said, as kind of an explanation why they invested so much, he said, well, we finally found something that beats like the treasury bond yield or something. So basically saying, kind of saying, there's nothing we really love, but you know, the hurdle was just so low that you know, we finally found something. Yeah, he was, I think he was in context. It, it was basically a question about why did you back up the truck now? In the, and, and that was a bit of an overstatement. No one said back up the truck and they didn't, in fact, quite back up the truck. But they were certainly far more active in the first quarter than they've been in a long time. Someone asked a question along those lines and Charlie said, yeah, it's because we found some stuff we like better than treasuries, which of course highlights exactly what you said, which is a bit both a declining market and, you know, kind of speculative behavior gone wrong is good hunting grounds for them, better hunting grounds for them. And just the low, you know, the, the, the alternative of holding treasuries is not real great. Even now that rates have gone up, it's still not that great. So they would always love to do something better and different. And this was kind of the first opportunity they've had to do it in size in a few years. Yeah. A couple other things. Um, one was um, Buffett's indirect criticism of index funds. You know, in the past, in his letters and, and, and statements, he always kind of was in, seemed to endorse index funds as a good way, good place to put your money where you're not paying Wall Street's fees and so forth, and you're just going to track the progress of corporate America. But this time, I, I felt like he basically was expressing that index funds may have gotten too big. And because their ownership of most or many American companies is so large, there's a problem now because index funds really do not act like typical owners. Um, they basically, you know, they use a lot of consultants and advisors and kind of make stupid uh, decisions a lot of the time that, that a true owner might not make. And, you know, that that's obviously related also to, you know, the proposal to split the chairmanship and the CEO role and, and some other things where kind of corporate governance advisory companies can go way astray. Uh, maybe start with a good thought, but ultimately when it comes to a company like Berkshire, uh, those things are completely out of place. Uh, so that was one thing I noticed on that, on that front, passive investing. 
Yeah, I, I didn't catch, I might have missed uh, some of the direct comments there. Yeah, I didn't notice a huge shift. I think they did, might have been Charlie made a comment that there was, you know, still this threat that if we got to 90% ownership by passive index funds, it'd be a real problem, but obviously we're not close to that. So, um, but yeah, no, I agree with your, your thoughts and your comments there. I mean, I think he said plenty of times over the years that he continues to recommend index funds for almost everyone and that you know his estate mandates that all of his effectively all of his equity be given to charity and his his uh wife's estate would get 10 percent treasury bills and 90 percent in s p 500 index fund i think we would stand by that today but with the with the caveat and the criticisms like you said that as with anything there's always a trade-off and we're we're starting to see some of those trade-offs i think more and more every day now right there's no rainbows and sunshine unlimited right everything has a drawback and this certainly fall in that category for, for people that have to deal with the implications of index funds just owning so much stuff right it's it's pretty stark yeah you know i i want to pick up on uh one thing john said before that too because i find this index uh idea pretty interesting but but I, I i like john your comments on uh berkshire investing in like commodities now and how that's you know different than what buffett has said in the past but the other buy that we know happened during the last quarter was hewlett packard so it's like commodities and tech and hey you know two of the areas that buffett has been like we don't really do much there um even after the bad lesson in ibm uh he's back at it with hewlett packard well Again, maybe not uh, Buffett himself, but maybe the Apple experience is kind of informed a little of where they're looking in tech. But you know, who would have thought tech and commodities are where incremental cash is going? Um, although it does make sense in the light of uh, you know one of the arguments I've had about inflation is if it's real, tech is probably one of the better places to be, especially in areas where like to although it's not exactly the case with Hewlett Packard, but serving the M plus one customer costs no more than serving uh, you know the nth customer. Um, but I, I found that to be interesting and notable. Yeah, I don't know if I missed it. I didn't hear any direct commentary on Hewlett Packard, but um, yeah, I would agree. I mean, it seems like a you know a combination of things. Like I think you you hit on it, and uh, there was a little bit of commentary around Apple, which you know for all the you know ridiculous criticism about you know you missed the ball or whatever. I mean, there are very very few ways for someone in his shoes to take forty billion and quadruple it in a few years as as Apple. So, um, you know, I I think that goes without saying that that was a pretty epic home run and that it's not an issue of lack of understanding about certain factors and certain technologies and whatever. I mean, there's just a lot of things in that world that I think are difficult to forecast for for him and for most people. And so he just has an iron discipline to avoid those things that he feels like he can't forecast. And so, but I, I would share your thought of it. he did not touch on this as far as i know but yeah in an inflationary world a company whose primary expenses are variable and do not require ongoing treadmill capital expenditures to just keep volumes flat is a much better place to be than the alternative so you know uh, if you were a macro style investor and you could invest in just commodities that were going to benefit and businesses with real pricing power that don't have much in the way of hard assets that'd be a pretty good portfolio right yeah, am I recalling right? Did he say that they bought a little bit more Apple in the last yeah, quarter? Yeah, a little bit. Yep, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, in light of Munger's comments about we finally found something we prefer to Treasuries, it's like I, I do feel like there's this uh, Apple is like one of the most liquid stocks of cash, and I don't mean stocks in the sense that it's a stock, but that you could literally treat it as kind of like your opportunity cost versus Treasuries in certain people's positions. And I do think to an extent, that's why it's got the valuation it does relative to some other more recently beaten down tech stocks. But um, I find that to be pretty interesting. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I don't wonder there's... if I had a guess, perhaps, you know, like he didn't talk about it, but I'd imagine a, a, a company like MasterCard uh, would fit the mantra, fit in between like commodities and tech, where you'd want to have some positive exposure amidst inflation. Um, and I think those stocks have been like notably strong year to date, although weak last year versus, uh, some other things, maybe that was where, uh, I'm purely speculating here, but maybe that was one of the hunting grounds they, they did explore a little more. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. It was not something that came up, at least as far as I heard, but it would have been interesting to hear more about it. Yeah, they do have ample payments exposure. Yeah, 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 for sure. What do you guys uh, think on about succession? Was there anything new on that front, Phil? There was nothing super new. I mean, uh, Greg Abel and Eugene Jane were both on the stage. Uh, so there were four people on stage for the morning session, uh, which was a notable change. I guess that's the first time there's ever been all four of them on the same stage. And then Ajit and Greg left after lunch or went back into the audience after lunch. And so in the morning session, they, uh, Ajit and Greg both answered uh, specific questions. And uh, so that was nice to see. There was no, as far as I know, there was no further explicit uh, discussion, but I mean, Greg Abel's already been acknowledged as the CEO in waiting, so to speak. So I don't think there was much need for clarification there. I will say that, um, through his answers and just through kind of thinking through it as I was sitting there, it became just blindingly obvious as it has always been. So I'm sure other people have thought this as well, but it just occurred to me again that a G chain is, in my opinion, by far the second most uh, important person in the history of Berkshire. I mean, just the sheer amount of value that he's added to the company over the years is, is staggering. So uh, and, and he, he did make some interesting comments about Geico, by the way. So, um, you know, someone asked about the relative performance of some of the big Berkshire operating subsidiaries like Geico. And Ajit said there was no doubt that Progressive has been doing very well recently. And he attributed the outperformance to uh, Geico's relatively late embrace of telematics. So uh, basically technology driven ways to measure uh, behavior and underwrite risks a little more intelligently. And I remember about probably seven or eight years ago, something like that. There was a question in the audience, I wonder if I could dig up the clip somewhere, kind of asking a forward looking question about this, like, you know, shouldn't, isn't all insurance gonna go the way of telematics basically and get out in front of this? And at the time, Buffett was a little bit dismissive and said, you know, we think we're measuring the risks just fine. And we don't think that this ultimately changes behavior in a way that can be captured by an insurance company. And here we are, you know, a few years later and that's proven not to be the case. So it's just kind of interesting that that's how it developed. Yeah, and didn't Buffett say that Ajit Jain has created more value for Berkshire than the whole market cap of Progressive? I think he did say that, yeah. There was some comment along those lines. I can't remember what the exact word was. He did kind of break down the various market caps of all the the players in the insurance world, particularly in the auto and home insurance lines. And uh, he did say something like that. And he certainly made you know, somewhat tongue in cheek, but also somewhat serious references, you know, in prior annual letters, probably 10 or 20 years ago, that if, if, if you know, Buffett and Munger and Jane were all on a boat and it was going down and you could only save one swim to a cheat, right? So I think he's been very well aware for a very long time that it's just been, you know, the ultimate home run for the company. Yeah. You know, one area that, that, that I found interesting where I kind of, disagree with Buffett or feel like he's engaging in some wishful thinking is when he says, and he kept talking about how Berkshire is going to be around a hundred years from now because of its culture and, and, and all that stuff. And I hope he's right, but I just kind of feel like when you have so few people at the headquarters, um, that culture um, is at the headquarters and yeah, it does get out as well to to the businesses but you know when you think two generations of leadership down the road i mean yeah greg abel and a g jane they're going to continue what buffett has done and munger but who are going to be their successors and will will they basically tell their successors you know we leave it up to you to 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 do what you think is best, and so they're not gonna break up Berkshire. Um, but can you really say it's gonna be in one piece a hundred years from now? I'm just really not sure about that. And yeah, uh, it's it's fascinating. I mean, look, I, I've thought about this some, and I certainly don't have any concrete answers to give. But you're right. I mean, a hundred years is a long time. Very few organizations, let alone publicly traded companies ever make it that long. The, the standard line from Buffett and Munger over the years has been that 
they think the culture is so strong that it will last a lot longer than anybody thinks. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, the way most organizations decay is through bureaucracy and complacency and, you know, kind of rotting from the inside out. And I think that risk is far, far, far lower here than just about any other company of its size or any company of any size for that matter. But you're right. I mean, a hundred years is a long time. Anything can happen. It is going to have to be, uh, you know, managed, I guess, in a sense that you can't allow it to decay from the top down or from the bottom up in terms of bureaucracy and complacency creeping in. I tend to think that, yeah, I mean, the biggest risk would be that it's not this generation, but the next, and there's a bad hire or a bad promotion or something along the way. I, I agree. You also have to worry about it at the operating level, right? The individual companies outside of headquarters, but that I guess seems a little more manageable just in the sense that they do all have their own cultures. Now they've all seemed to do pretty well. And Berkshire has certainly had plenty of individual operating subsidiaries fail over the years, you know, particularly just slow kind of bleed out kind of deaths. I mean, Berkshire Hathaway itself was, was an example of that. And so I think if there were to be some sort of failure or stagnation or bleed out of an operating subsidiary, it wouldn't necessarily spell the end of the company or a need to break it up. I mean, obviously in practical terms, you really can't break it up, at least in short order. So um, I, it, it's, it's really interesting to see. I mean, I, I would bet very strongly that the company continues quite well and, and continues to retain its key characteristics and its culture for a matter of decades. But uh, I'm with you. I mean, 100 years is obviously a long time. A lot can change. Yeah, and I'm thinking also that you know that pressure could eventually come from the from the shareholders themselves. I mean, because when you have a company of that size, you're pretty much going to be generating an average return, let's say an S and P 500 return, and you can add a percentage point or two on top of that. Um, but what what that means is just because of normal volatility, you might have a decade where Berkshire delivers no return or underperforms. And when you know that's happening under leadership that's not Buffett and Munger, maybe not even Greg Abel and, and Ajith Jain, but some other leader, you know, the shareholders might start asking questions and putting some pressure on to say, hey, the market's not recognizing this asset enough and, and that asset. And so, yeah, it's just, you know, I wish that Berkshire can be an exception for forever, but at some point, just the sheer size of it may result in just the the regular kind of dynamics of People saying, hey, we'll be better off if we just break off some pieces. Yeah, I, I wouldn't preclude breaking off some pieces by any stretch of the imagination. I wouldn't preclude things that are currently somewhat unthinkable, like special cash dividends or something like that. But, uh, and you're right, I, I would also think that at some point over the next 15 to 50 years, let alone 100 years, you'll see some measure of shareholder discontent and a proposal that has some chance of succeeding along those lines. Again, I would think that the overall performance of the company and the, or the ongoing culture of the organization will carry the day and that it won't be a sea change from what we currently have. Now, again, if the company stagnates or performs really, really poorly for a period of time, that's obviously going to make it easier for the insurgent crowd to come in and, and shake things up. But again, I mean, just for a practical matter, I mean, it, it's really not possible. If, if somebody came in and started agitating along the lines of, let's say, you know, BNSF is underperforming and should be spun off, I mean, it's just not really possible. So um, both from a tax or an ownership basis. So, um, it, but I, yeah, like you said, I think there will be plenty of saber rattling around that if you stick around for enough decades. Yeah, I keep wondering about this question. Like, why has Buffett not spoken more to succession? Like, why isn't it something where, you know, there's an opportunity to shape it from his seat um, and at least to shape expectations? And then the other side of me is like, well, the less he says and does, the more degrees of freedom, whoever, you know, the, the future will have. 
um, the more opportunity, the more choices will be on the table. Like maybe there's a degree of uh, deglomeration, maybe there's not, but the more you say up front, the more you become committed to a certain path. So perhaps that's quite helpful. But I feel like you can't just punt on it forever. You have to give people a sense of like today, you know, if you're underwriting for the long term, you really do need to know what it's going to look like. Um, yeah, I, well, think I think that's he's given that. I think he's given that clarity now. I mean, it, I guess you could criticize the timeline on which it was disclosed or the circumstances under which it was disclosed. But I think the board has always been very explicitly informed as to what the plan would be. And the public has been less informed. I think that's actually appropriate. And, you know, look, I think it's going to look very much like a, a reconstituted board that has two of his kids on it to keep the, you know, is, is the Ministry of Culture, so to speak, to, to kind of watch over things and, and have the last name and the gravitas that that brings. And you're going to have Greg Abel running the show and you're going to have the investment managers doing their part. And, and that's what it is. And I think that should give you, if everything goes well, at least an initial 10 or 20 year run, right, to, to kind of get things going. I mean, I, things could obviously change and, and go wrong, but I, I could guarantee that succession has been at the top of mind for many, many years because he doesn't want to see this just waste away after a short period of time. Yeah, no, you make good points. And I think that's very fair. Yeah, I was, I feel just torn. Like, I think it's, it's, beneficial in a lot of ways to not give too much up front either. Um, but it just, yeah, I think that was always a point that I didn't quite appreciate was that if 15 years ago, he had named an explicit, an explicit successor, that just puts an unreasonable burden of expectations on that individual. And it raises lots of thorny issues. If as potentially happened, what was it about 10 years ago that that successor changes and so I think it actually made some good sense. And I think, as usual, he's playing chess when most other people are playing checkers and has really thought through these issues. And I'm not saying there's a perfect answer. I just think this is probably the, the best answer given the alternatives. So, the other, Phil, you know... Sorry, I, go ahead, John. Yeah. No, I, I, maybe as we wrap it up, I was just wondering kind of your overall impressions of... The, the weekend in Omaha and, and what's changed from pre-COVID and, um, and maybe if you have any thoughts on how it's going to look post Buffett and Munger, is it even going to happen? Is there going to be another kind of um, magnet, uh, so to speak? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, my overall thoughts are that it was actually really nice to go back. I obviously haven't been to the meeting since 2019 because it wasn't held in 2020 or 2021. It was great to see that, you know, the name on the arena may have changed, but that was literally about it. I think mean, there's some interesting new construction projects happening in Omaha and it seems to be doing well, but that's literally it. I mean, everything else was almost exactly the same. I mean, there were some companies that weren't presenting at their usual booth in the exhibit hall, but I mean, it literally was almost a carbon copy of prior years with the you know, the exception being that the crowds were slightly reduced due to COVID and, you know, everybody's a couple of years older, but it was reassuring in the sense that so little had changed, right? It was, it was like, you know, you woke up from a bed to your dream. Uh, so that, that was good. Yeah. And as far as what will change down the road, I really have no idea. I mean, I think we're all lucky to not have to worry about that until that day arrives. I mean, I think once the inevitable day comes when they're no longer in charge, um, I think the leadership that's in place will take up the torch and run with it, but it's obviously not going to be the same. I mean, you'll never be able to recreate what exists now. I mean, the people will be different. The circumstances will be different. I think there will always be an annual meeting. There will always be uh, some sub, some sub, sub-segment of investors that want to make that trip to Omaha and go to the annual meeting, uh, regardless of who's nominally in charge of the company, because it's, in my opinion, it's the crowning achievement in American capitalism to pull this off and put it all together and have it persist for as many decades as it has with the results that it has. 
and all the people and careers and lives that it's touched, I think there will always be a demand for that. But I, I certainly expect that it'll look and feel much different at that point, no doubt. Okay, great. Uh, well, I, yeah. On a quick, more fun note, since that was a little gloomy, I did write this down because I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, during the movie, uh, there wasn't a ton of new comment, but there was a Jimmy Buffett song kind of playing over a slideshow. <laughs> Jimmy Buffett actually gave an interview before the meeting where he talked about his cousin, Warren, <laughs> cousin in air quotes. I think there might be some tenuous link there where they're actually somewhat related, but cousin in air quotes where Jimmy Buffett said that he bought Berkshire, Hair, Berkshire shares 25 years ago and has never sold a single share. So he didn't talk dollar amounts, but I looked up the numbers and uh, the shares have returned about 1,138% over that period. It's about 10.6% uh, per year compound over two and a half decades. So if Jimmy Buffett bought 10 grand of shares back then, he's worth 124,000 today, which is pretty darn impressive and really cool. But not that Jimmy Buffett needed the money. He does okay, I think. <laughs> With his empire, but I thought that was pretty amazing that he bought shares 25 years ago and has never sold a single one. So hopefully that's a happier, cheerier thought in this uh, dark and troubled world at the moment. Well, we'll end it there then. Uh, thank you so much, Phil and Elliot. And I hope everyone listening enjoyed the conversation as well. We'll talk to you guys uh, next week. Take care. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.